Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to um, Politics and Prose. I'm, I'm Brad Graham. I'm the <coughs> co-owner of the bookstore, along with uh, my wife, Lisa Muscatine. And let me s stay, say at the start how um, truly exciting it is to be holding this event uh, here uh, in person after a, a two-year inter interruption because of the pandemic. You know, we, we uh, only resumed in-person events at this location uh, earlier this month, and um, this is really one of the largest turnouts that we've had so far, so, so that's, that's, that's great. And, uh, and you know, while, while we will continue to, to do uh, some events online uh, in the weeks ahead uh, at the request of, uh, of authors, um, we are planning to schedule more and more in-person in uh, sessions as the pandemic recedes. And I, I also want to take this opportunity to, um, to say thanks, you know, because uh, PMP couldn't have survived uh, through this, this pandemic without the continued support from you know, loyal customers like you. And, and also um, without the, uh, the tireless and courageous efforts of, of our staff. Uh, they've really uh, been as much a reason as, as any for, for, for how uh, uh, allowing us to, to make it through it. You know, as a business, we're still uh, not uh, fully quite back to where we were before the pandemic, but, but we're getting there, and, and I, I do remain confident uh, about the future. A couple of brief housekeeping notes. Uh, mass mandate is back in effect because D.C. went to a yellow rating the other day again, uh, given the rising infection rate. So um, if you don't have a mask but, um, um, or you're tired of the one you're wearing and you'd like a new one, we'd be ha happy. <laughs> Happy to, to give you one. When we get to the Q&A uh, later in the talk, the microphone uh, is right here, so please come, come, come up to it if you, if you do have a question. And at the end of the event, our staff would really appreciate it uh, if you would help them and um, fold up the chairs that you're s sitting in and lean them against you know, a bookcase or a pillar or something that won't topple over. Okay, on with the show. So uh, we're very delighted to have uh, with us Yasha Monk, um, who's here to talk about his new book, The Great Experiment, Why Diverse Democracies Fall Apart and How They Can Endure. Uh, Yasha is a writer and a, an academic known for his works on the crisis of democracy and in defense of liberal values. He holds a doctorate in, in government and is an associate professor of the practice of international affairs at Johns Hopkins. He's also founder and editor of the magazine Persuasion and a contributing editor at The Atlantic. And in addition to numerous articles, he's written several very thoughtful books. Uh, this latest book is his fourth, and in it, Yasha examines the threats to democratic societies stemming from their growing racial, religious, and, and ethnic diversity. Such diversity, of course, has had a way of generating conflict and violence and making it harder to keep peace among competing groups. And these days, as Yasha notes, at the start of his book, there's, there's much pessimistic commentary about the ability of diverse democracies like ours to hold things together. But Yasha contends it shouldn't be all doom and gloom, that there are reasons to be optimistic about the future of participatory open societies, like the meaningful strides that have been made toward equality by minority groups and, and the shifting more accepting mainstream views on race and religion. You know, Yasha is, as, as he admits, uh, arguably more upbeat about democracy's survival than is fashionable nowadays, but the view he puts forward is, is compelling and provides a refreshing counter-argument to, to the doomsayers. So I think we're in for a, a quite a provocative discussion. And to moderate that discussion, we're very privileged uh, uh, to also have Ann Applebaum, longtime journalist and columnist who's currently a staff writer at The Atlantic and is, I'm sure, familiar to, to many of you. She's the author of three terrific books ab about the Soviet Union and her most recent work, Twilight of Democracy, explores why so, so many today have abandoned uh, liberal democratic ideals in favor of, of strongman cults, nationalist movements, and, or, or one-party states. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Yasha Monk and Ann Applebaum. <laughs> 
So thank you so much for that introduction and welcome everybody to my home bookstore. Um, this is, you know, this is me playing with my home colors. Um, I grew up near here and this is the bookstore I came to when I was growing up and I think every single one of my books has been presented here um, one way or another. So thanks, thanks for coming and I'm of course delighted to be here with Yasha. Um, in the introduction, Yasha and I actually co-teach a class together. Um, and so normally it's you know me listening to him lecture or him listening to me lecture, and tonight it's going to be me getting to ask him questions. Um, his 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 book you've you've just heard introduced, so I won't do it again. Um, I I'm going to start actually though where he starts, which is um, with an anecdote that amused me because it was so familiar. <laughs> um, you know, there he was in Germany, a little nervous, you know, giving an interview like one does. Um, you know, about one of his previous books. He gave the talk, it seemed to go really well, he felt really good about himself. And then he woke up in the morning, and what happened? Yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> I think Anne, you've had an experience once or twice as well. I, I opened my, my phone after a 10 hour flight, and I thought the interview had gone perfectly fine. And my mom, who hates every interview I do, said, you did really great. And I opened my phone, and I just have email after email after email saying terrible things about me. And in particular, they seem to have gotten the impression that I had admitted uh, that I, alongside Angela Merkel, were experimenting on the German people and trying to replace the German population. Um, what, what was it that you'd said? You'd said, this is a great experiment or something. This was, uh, it was at the time of the, of the Syrian refugee crisis. Right, exactly. So I, I, I'd been asked about the causes for the rise of populism, and I said, Look, one of them is economic stagnation, the fact that a lot of people don't feel like they're making economic progress in the way that they had in previous generations. One of them is a topic that Anne thinks a, a lot about, the rise of the internet and of social media, the way that transforms public discourse. When I said we're also now, this is the title of the book, in the middle of uh, a great experiment, which is to turn mono-ethnic, monocultural societies into multi-ethnic <coughs> ones. And I think that's actually going to create all kinds of challenges, but I think we can succeed in that. Now, they took me to mean that this is an experiment like uh, the chemistry teacher in ninth or 10th grade who comes in Makes and- this liquid and that liquid yeah, and boom. Yeah, boom, exactly. <laughs> <That's> and he <laughs> knows exactly what's going to happen <laughs> and he intends for it to happen, right? right. What I meant is uh, uh, an experiment in the way in which the, the framers of our constitution talked about a great experiment at the end of the 18th century that uh, who were doing something unprecedented as well because at the time there really weren't uh, examples of self-governing republics on a large scale that had managed to survive, that had managed to be stable. And yet, by circumstances, they found themselves in a situation where they thought, we've got to make it work somehow. And I think that's the situation we're in now with respect to um, multi-ethnic, multi-religious democracies that actually try to treat all of their citizens as equals. Um, but what do you think was it that caused the vitriol? Ha what's the source of that anger? Yeah, so that's very easy. It's the theory of a great replacement, which is a, a, a theory which is really strong on the far right of European politics, which is increasingly strong, interestingly, on the far right of American politics. Uh, and it basically has sort of three main points. The first of which is that uh, there's this deliberate plot uh, by elites uh, to replace the existing population with one that is more pliant, that is more likely to let them do their thing. The second, that everything is going really, really terribly, um, that immigrants who are coming in, that minority groups just aren't interested in, in democracy, they're not interested in integrating into societies, uh, and so the current state of our society is some kind of dystopia. And then the third point of it, which is, uh, well, so what's the logical conclusion if you buy these two premises, is to say, let's, let's stop everybody from coming in, let's somehow try to re-homogenize our societies, let's turn back the clock. Um, now, now, the way that I describe things, I think that uh, this theory is wrong in each of these parts. So interestingly, the source of uh, the diversity of contemporary democracies I is either very long-standing, so the United States has always been a diverse democracy, it just didn't treat all of its members equally until quite recently, um, or as in a place like Germany where I grew up, many European societies, <coughs> it had other kinds of goals. So in Germany there was a big economic miracle in the 50s and 60s, and uh, they had full employment and the factories needed unskilled labor um, and so the government went around and said, hey, we want people from poorer countries to come in, be guest workers, work here for a few years and then go back and obviously that's not how it panned out. 
Um, so the idea that you know conservative chancellor like Konrad Adenauer was trying to replace the German population is is silly. He had sort of straightforward economic motives, mm -hmm. right? Um, so the second point, um, and that that perhaps we'll, we'll discuss later in a little bit more detail, is that I actually think we're doing much better than the pessimists on on the right, but also a lot of pessimists in the mainstream and on the left are saying. Um, I think that especially by the standards mm -hmm. of other kinds of diverse societies throughout history. We're making real progress, and we're actually doing relatively well. It's just not true that immigrants aren't integrating. It's not true that we're not uh, 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 allowing them to make socioeconomic uh, progress. It's not true uh, that there is no reduction in, in the wage gap or no reduction in other kinds of gaps. And, and then the third point is, and this is really the starting point, this is not a book about how wonderful diverse democracies are. You know, Japan and Bulgaria can choose to remain comparatively homogeneous democracies if they want, that's a perfectly legitimate choice. But most democracies in the world, the United States and Germany and France, which is about to have an election, but also uh, India, also Brazil, already are incredibly diverse, incredibly heterogeneous. And they might stop being heterogeneous in that kind of way. Lots of examples in history of societies that were quite diverse for a while and then became much more homogeneous. But it was always uh, at the price of terrible injustice and terrible suffering, of civil war, of genocide, of ethnic cleansing, right? So we just don't have a choice. We need to make it work. And that's the premise of the book. That's the great experiment. And my attempt in the book is to think through why is this hard, but also how can we actually succeed? I, I want to get to how, how we can make it succeed, but I also want you to go back and focus a little bit again on that vitriol. Um, because you also, you're, you're what I like about the book is that you're also very clear about some very basic, I don't know, human tendencies or human instincts or na you know something to do with the human brain, um, which you call groupishness. So there is something that that leads people to to identify with a group, um, and it's been identified over and over again by political scientists, by sociologists, um, and others. Can can you just describe that and explain? how that might underlie some of the tensions that we, that we have, not yeah. just here, but everywhere. <coughs> so look, I grew up with the hope that humans might be able to overcome that kind of groupishness, right? My mom, um, who's the you know, daughter of Holocaust survivors, uh, has the sense that groups are dangerous because groups can be what uh, makes you really prefer the in-group over the out-group at times in violent ways, and so, I grew up with this idea that, that, that it would be wonderful if we could just identify as individuals, perhaps as, as cosmopolitans, as people who care equally about everybody in the world. But both some of the political developments of the last decades and, and a lot of the reading I've done for this book and in uh, group psychology uh, and history have made me think that that's unfortunately a utopian idea. And the key figure in this perhaps is Henry Teifel, whose story I tell in the book. So Teifel was born not too far from your home in Poland, in, in, in the center of Poland. Um, he couldn't study in Poland because of a quota on the number of Jews going to university there. He, he went to France, um, studied at the Sorbonne, volunteered for the French army at the beginning of the war, survived the war as a prisoner of war, um, uh, but then found at the end of the war that most of his family had been murdered. And so he really wanted to understand what makes groups tick? What is it about groups? that makes the members so willing to discriminate against the outgroup. And so he had a really good idea as a social scientist. He said, look, I'm gonna create groups that are so silly and so pointless that the members are not gonna discriminate against outsiders. And then I can sort of ladle on little attributes of these groups until they start discriminating. And that will teach us what it is about groups that makes them so powerful, right? Great thought, it failed completely. Because what he did is he brought uh, a bunch of kids from the suburbs of Bristol into his lab and he showed them a sheet of paper with a bunch of dots on it. Let's say about 150 dots. He said, have a guess how many dots are on this sheet of paper. And so some said 120 and some said 180. He said, great, we're going to split you into underestimators and overestimators. And what happens next? He has them play a game and the underestimators discriminate against the overestimators. Mm -hmm. And I've done this with my undergrads who think of themselves as some of the most tolerant human beings in the history of the world, and perhaps actually they are. <laughs> but you ask them, is a hot dog a sandwich? And the people who say that a hot dog is a sandwich start to discriminate against the people who say a hot dog is not a sandwich. <laughs> and so I don't think that we can ever root out this groupishness. 
we have to manage it. We have to think how in our society do we make sure that even though people always is, are going to have this instinct to say, this is my group and I'm going to defend this group against that group, how can we build diverse democracies despite that human instinct? Um, yes. Yeah, so in the book, you talk about the different ways in which um, diverse democracies don't work, and you know, talk about anarchy. You know, they can fall apart completely. They can fragment. Um, one group can come to dominate um, another group. But you also um, um, you also think that this is not inevitable. Um, that there are ways around this. And you know, I I, I have um, you know long criticized the naive idea that if you you know, bring peop different people into a room and you know, introduce this person and that person, you know, that then they'll like each other because actually what sometimes happens is you bring different people into a room and you introduce them and then they discover, no, I really, really don't like that person. <laughs> and now that I've met him, I, really that, that figured. So, so given, you know, given that there are these so many different ways in which um, diverse societies can fragment and given that people um, don't often, that, that simple contact or simple interaction doesn't always S you know, solve the problem. What are some of the conditions that could change that? So, what are the circumstances where you could get better encounters between people? Yeah. So, there's a lot of great social science uh, insight about this, which which I tell uh, in the book. So, one of them is this intergroup contact theory, right? And so, it's a great finding um, uh, by a social psychologist who looks at what happens, for example, in a housing uh, project in Boston in the late 40s, early 50s, uh, there's some of these units that are segregated and some of these units that are not segregated. And he finds that in the non-segregated units, um, the residents start to have more positive views about each other than in the segregated units. But actually having a neighbor, if you're white, who's African-American in that context, actually makes you reduce some of the prejudices that you know a lot of Bostonians in 1950 would have held about African Americans. But there are um, conditions, right? So exactly. Yeah. So what's interesting about this, though, is that it doesn't always work. And this is a huge body of research. And what we show is you got you've, you've got to have uh, some equality in that situation. Now, obviously, you know, whites and African Americans were not equal in American society in 1950. But in that situ situation, there were just neighbors who had similar kind of units in the same housing block. So in that situation, they had a kind of equality, right? You have to be in a situation in which what's emphasized is the membership in a kind of common team, right? So there's a sense of, oh, we're both residents of this housing block, and we have shared interests in that. There has to be an institutional constellation in which the authorities actually encourage you to get along. Um, so these are some really important conditions, and if you start to violate those, then it's much less likely that you're going to end up getting along. Um, there's another great study which shows not just that social capital is important, so it's important to have associations and clubs and so on, but that you have to have social associations that bridge between different groups. So, so this great researcher looked at why did some uh, towns in India repeatedly experience these terrible intercommunal riots, as they call them, in India, you know, pogroms against Muslims, sometimes against Hindus, and why in others did they not do that? And so you might think, well, in one room perhaps they just have more associational life, and so that's better. That's not the case. It's about whether the associational life bridges the divide between the communities or just runs within the communities. Because it's in the towns where uh, you know, Hindus and Muslims were members of the same kind of associations that when political tensions ran really high, they could say, no, hang on a second, there's these terrible rumors going around. I don't think that's true. You know, my friend who I trust from the right group is telling me that's not true. Let's look into this before we go out in the street and you know beat somebody up or, or, or worse. Um, and so I think creating intergroup contact in which we're trying to make people get along and emphasizing their equality, emphasizing the common interests, and creating all kinds of associations in society in which people have contact with each other are some of the basic preconditions for managing this group issues. Now, in, in, in the book, you also kind of build that up. I mean, that's the kind of basic social science, but how does that get us to how we structure or think about societies more broadly? Um, you have these different, um, you know, you have these different, you know, visions of how society could be organized, which you give, you know, you have a melting pot, a salad bowl, um, a public park. Um, un unpack that a little bit. So what, what are the... 
Um, how, how do we build on those? Okay, we have these social science observations, but how do we actually use those in, in a real polity, in real life? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, where, where do you get to when you're saying, look, people are groupish and they're always going to be members of these groups. That's always going to be important and salient to them. But it's also really important to have connections between different people because only then are you going to avoid the worst forms of discrimination, the worst forms of conflict. Well, what you get to is a vision of society which values subnational identity groups, right? which values that people are going to give a lot of importance to their <coughs> religion, to their cultural origin, to some extent perhaps to their ethnicity. But you also are going to say, we need a society in which we're encouraging people to have contact with each other on all kinds of dimensions. Right? So with that in mind, I went back to some of the standard metaphors that people have suggested for what uh, a sort of diverse society might look like. <coughs> the traditional one is the melting pot, right? Um, and people sneer that in the literature. Um, I actually went back to read the play uh, on which that term was based by Israel Zangwal, who was premiered here in Washington, D.C. in 1905. It's actually a beautiful play which tells the love story of um, uh, a, a refugee, a Jewish refugee whose family was killed in a pogrom, and uh, uh, the daughter of a Russian baron. And it turns out at the sort of dramatic height of his play that it's his, that it's her father who com co commanded the troops who killed his family. And so he breaks off the engagement. But later he says, no, I, we have to overcome these kinds of hatreds from the old world. Um, that is what I've always uh, stood for. You know, he's a composer who's trying to create the sound of a new American man and he's saying, you know, that is what, what the new world is, as far as to be able to overcome these hatreds. So it's not a, an ahistorical view. It's not a view that's unaware of historical suffering of intergroup conflict. It has this heroic vision of, of, of connection. But the way that the metaphor of a melting pot has been used, and to some extent the way in which it was conceived, asks too much sameness, right? It's saying, in this new America, we're going to have a culture that's influenced by all kinds of groups and all kinds of newcomers, but we're all going to be identical to each other. We're no longer going to think of these original groups as important. We're you know, throwing them in the melting pot and they dissolve and they're no longer important. And that just is not a realistic vision or I think an attractive vision of what that society should look like. It's good for there to be some differences between us. That's natural. We're not going to overcome that. That's fine. Now, in part, as a result, the sort of rejection of this has been to say, uh, let's have a salad bowl or let's have a mosaic. Let's just have a society which, as some philosophers put it, is an association of associations. So we no longer think of each other as individuals with rights and duties. We just think of society as this assemblage of groups. And all of our standing is defined relative to those kinds of groups. And that, I think, is also wrong. It's also dangerous uh, for a number of reasons, because it allows those groups often to be tyrannical towards their own members. Um, it means that if you grow up in a group and you want to change groups, you actually might not be able to do that, as is the case today in Lebanon and many other parts of the world. But it also means that we're not going to have that connective tissue which actually allows us to keep the peace and manage our groupishness, make sure that we don't get into deeper and deeper fights. And so what I suggest as a kind of metaphor, but it's really just a metaphor, is that of a public park. Because in a public park, you know, and you and I can go together and say, we don't want to talk to anybody else. We just want to stay among ourselves. But we might also go and meet new people. We might go and have new encounters. Um, and we have a right to do either. And that's true in a diverse democracy, right? You can have Amish who say, we're just staying within the Amish and we're not talking to anybody else. And that's a perfectly good right. Nothing wrong with that. But also, when you think about it in the aggregate, you realize that there's something wrong in a, with a park in which nobody ever makes a new connection, in which nobody ever feels ready to speak to each other. And in our society, there would be a real problem if people just stay within the groups to such an extent that there's never any kind of connective tissue between them. So that's the sort of a metaphor of a public park. And how, and explain to me, how, and how is that metaphor useful? So how do you translate that up into political conversation or into laws and rules? I mean, um, you know, what, how, how does that help us think differently about reform of our political system, for example? Yeah, so I think, um, so we'll get to that perhaps. I don't think the solutions here are bills in front of Congress, right? And I actually, my optimism stems in part from the fact that the political level is all screwed up. I think Anne and I agree on that. Uh, but that actually a lot of the developments in society are quite positive. And so just, I think, understanding what we need for the society to work is helpful in itself, <coughs> right? There's people who are saying, hey, 
if immigrants are coming in and their children, their grandchildren are still somehow different from quote unquote real Americans or from quote unquote typical Americans, then there's a problem, right? Uh, and that I think is wrong. And there's people who are saying, hey, uh, you know, there's a popular book at the moment saying, reject assimilation. Um, you know, we want to stay as separate as possible and we should celebrate people not integrating into a kind of mainstream at all. And that I think is also a mistake. And so I think just knowing what the right kind of ideal is that we should be aiming for, including in education, including in all of the informal institutions of society, um, is really important. Now, it does also help us think about the more formal legal level. So I have a sort of chapter where I really think through, you know, when you have a group and you have the individual and you have a state, how should they relate to each other on, on a formal level? And that chapter is a defense of the philosophical principles of liberalism. Because what I say is that we need double freedom, right? We need a freedom where uh, I can be in the minority and be safe, right? I can come from a minority religion, I can come from a minority ethnic group, and no, neither the state nor some kind of mob of the majority is going to go and threaten me or put me in jail or anything like that. That's a classical liberal freedom. We also need the second freedom, which is that I might grow up as a member of a group, um, but I might want to change how I live. I might not want to go along with how my parents see things. I might want to date somebody that my parents disapprove of. Or perhaps I want, might want to date and my parents disapprove of me dating anybody at all because they think I shouldn't have sex before marriage or whatever else the case may be. And so I think uh, I it's also really important to make sure that people have a second freedom to leave their group if they choose to do so. Um, and there's now very popular uh, sort of communitarian philosophies which say no. The way to manage a diverse society is to say you have a group of Southern Baptists and you have a group of Jews and you have a group of Muslims and you have a group of uh, Methodists or whatever and we should think of them as the founding basis of our society. We just have a kind of compact between these different kind of groups. But that is the wrong way to value groups. In a free society, the reason why we have respect for groups is that we have individual citizens with rights and duties, and they invest groups with significance. They freely choose to become, or often just to remain, members of the groups in which they were raised. And that's what gives us uh, respect for those groups. So, so philosophical liberals deeply respect religion. They deeply respect groups but we respect them because these groups are willing to, are able to win the free acceptance of their members, not because they're tyrannical and impose themselves on their members. And that I think is a fundamental way of understanding the basic political rules of our society. Um, one of the other subjects that you talk about, which is one that you and I have discussed before, and I've, I've also tried to write a little bit about, um, is the role that patriotism can play as a kind of, glue that brings people together. And I use specifically the word patriotism rather than the word nationalism. Um, you know, that whether there is an idea about, you know, whether um, about uh, shared values in a shared society or something that we can, some kernel of something that we can be proud of together, and whether that promoting that isn't part of the solution too. It certainly has been considered to be that in the past. Well, so you've just come back from Ukraine, right? I think Ukraine is a great example of how patriotism can sometimes be a really positive force. There's millions of people who have volunteered for the Ukrainian army in the last months uh, because they love the country and they want to ensure that it can be self-determining despite this terrible, brutal attack on it by, by Vladimir Putin. Um, I think about George Orwell, who risked his own life for the Spanish Republic against the fascists in the 30s, sitting down in the middle of World War II and doing something that might seem surprising at first, which is uh, to write a defense of patriotism. But what he said at the time is that if British intellectuals had succeeded in the project of, uh, sort of freeing the British people from patriotism, we wouldn't have withstood the blitz. The men of the SS would now be uh, patrolling the streets of London. So um, that to me is the case for patriotism, but the question then becomes what form of patriotism? because Putin probably claims to be a patriot as well, right? So what's the distinction? And, and I think that there's sort of two traditional notions of patriotism and one that I'm trying to add to in this book. So the first is an ethnic form of nationalism or of patriotism, right? Which says to be a true uh, Russian, to be a true German, to be a true Italian, 
you have to have grandparents and great grandparents and great great grandparents who also were part of this ethnic group who descend from the same uh, tribe. <coughs> and that's obviously something that I disagree with. I disagree that that has the kind of normative significance that's claimed for it. Uh, I worry about the way in which you can precisely uh, license attacks on other countries because you can then very easily say, well, there's something special about our group. So even if you think that's also true of your group, we're going to go and invade you. Um, but it's also, by the way, empirically uh, uh, unrealistic now. Most Americans know that they have fellow citizens who come from different parts of the world than them. Uh, and that has historically been the case in the United States because it's a country of immigration. Um, but it is now also the case in many parts of Western Europe. Um, where 30 or 40 years ago people said, but you know, you have to come from the same group to be a real fellow citizen. But now a majority of Germans and Frenchmen and, and Swedes and so on say, no, 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 no. Somebody who came in here you know, 20 or 30 years ago, who, who speaks the language, who has integrated into our society, they are also real Swedes or real Germans and real French people. Okay. So we can get rid of ethnic nationalism. The second kind of notion. It's a bad week for ethnic nationalism. <laughs> Well, it's been a bad century or two for ethnic nationalism, I think. Um, now, the second notion that people then traditionally go to, that I went to in my last book, is civic patriotism, constitutional patriotism, right? It's to say, look, uh, a healthy patriotism is one that is rooted in values, that is rooted in something like the US Constitution or the Indian Constitution or the German Grundgesetz. Um, and that says what unites us is, is a set of ideals about how we want to govern ourselves. Now, I think there's something very powerful about that. I became a United States citizen five years ago, uh, and especially in March of 2017, I was very proud to swear to defend the United States Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. <laughs> um, so, so the Constitution has deep significance to me, and it's one of the reasons why I was proud to become an American. Um, it's also, by the way, why those, unfortunately not very many Russians who have been protesting against the war in the last months are true patriots. Because they're saying, not in our name, not in the name of our nation. That's a very powerful patriotic appeal. So civic patriotism is an important element of a healthy patriotism. But it's not enough. And the reason it's not enough is simply that most people don't care that much about politics. And most people probably can't tell you what, what's in the Eighth Amendment. And so it just, it would be nice if the world was like that. It's just not like that. That's not actually what sustains a love of country in, in most countries to such an extent. It's an important element, it's not everything. So that's why I want to add a third conception, uh, which might sound surprising, which I call a cultural patriotism. Now what I mean by cultural patriotism is not you know, worshipping the Mayflower and traditional costumes and stuff like that. You know, societies will always be somewhat influenced by their histories and, 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 and that's fine. They can be proud of the good parts of it just as they should be um, uh, aware and contrite about the bad parts of it. Um, but what I mean is something much more straightforward. When most people say I love my country, I think what they think is that they love its cities and landscapes, its sights and smells and sounds. It's sort of everyday cultural scripts for the way that we deal with each other. Um, you know, it's, it's celebrities, it's TikTok stars. It's that um, dynamic, everyday, naturally diverse culture, which actually is the kid that holds a country like the United States together, and which actually makes most Americans love their country. And I think that that's something that we shouldn't be afraid of, that we should recognize, and that we can celebrate. Which is actually what Orwell wrote in that essay. I mean, he had the, the essay that Yasha is referring to um, f famously begins with him saying, um, as I write this, perfectly civilized human beings and flying machines are trying to kill me. Um, and then he goes on, to, and he makes this famous list where he lists the things that makes people British, and it's things like, you know the clatter of clogs on a Sunday morning in the in the northern in the northern cities, and you know the old maids bicycling to church on the misty morning. I mean, it's a, it's a little bit over romanticized, but it's but it's literally a list of things you might have seen in Orwell's England and would make you think of England and wouldn't make you think of anywhere else. And one of the remarkable things on the list, which um, I, you know I thought was a contemporary um, uh, idea or, or, or notion or prejudice, perhaps. Uh, but clearly already existed in the 1930s, is bad teeth yeah. as one of the national characteristics of England. Um, but I think that shows that, you know, you can love what is yours and Glad be bad aware... Bad teeth and smoggy, smoky <coughs> streets. Yeah. That, yes, yeah. yeah. Right. And you can be aware that it also has lots of drawbacks, right? So the point of this patriotism is not to say everything is wonderful, right? But it's to say, this is mine, I have a special responsibility 
uh, to it and a res special responsibility to fight against what's unjust in it as well. And you know, I'm somebody, I grew up in Germany, I've lived in England, I've lived in Italy and France and visited lots of places in the world. Uh, I have a connection to many of those places that, that goes deep, but they're not the same. Right? And I think people underestimate that. Because America is such a diverse country, they think, oh, you know, what is it to be American? Well, go to Britain or go to Germany, go to Italy or go to Japan or go somewhere else and say, hey, actually, there are things that, that unite Americans, perhaps more than we're sometimes aware. That doesn't mean America is better. You can love your wife without thinking that uh, uh, other women in the world are somehow terrible or somehow inferior. You just have a special love for what is yours. And I think that, that, that can be a healthy thing. And, is, and would you describe that as, because you also talk in your book, and this is something I get asked about a lot and I also wrote about in my book, um, you talk about optimism and pessimism and the importance of remaining optimistic. Is that the source of your optimism or one of them? Y yeah, it's one of them. I mean, um, look, I think there's a, there's a sort of paradoxical pincher movement here. Um, that's a terrible mixed military metaphor and you know, at this particular time we should try to avoid those. Um, but what I find in the debate about the current state of, of our diverse democracies is that a lot of people come in with a kind of naive optimism, wi which I relate to, right? But it's sort of saying, look, diversity is our strength and this should all be easy. You know, how hard is it not to be a bigot? How hard is it not to be welcoming to your neighbor just because they happen to be from a different group? But then you look at society today and you say, well, there's all kinds of terrible things, and there's terrible politicians, and there's real injustice and real racism and real bigotry and all of those things. And so there must be something uniquely terrible about us. And, and you know, that way easily the optimism uh, suddenly turns into a pessimism. I'm like, oh my God, if, if it should be easy and it's going so badly, how can we ever make this work? And I think in this book I have sort of the opposite movement, which is to start with the real pessimism, to start with recognition that throughout history some of the worst crimes uh, from the Holocaust to the Rwandan genocide to you know, dozens and dozens of other examples were one ethnic or religious group fighting against another, oppressing another, treating it terribly. Um, the history of our own country, slavery and so many other things. Um, now that might make you think that you're going to despair, but when you then look back at society today, you actually are saying, hey, by comparison to our own past, by comparison to so many other societies in the world, we are actually doing pretty well. And we've made real progress in the last decades. And perhaps we can continue to make progress on that front. Um, so, so, so one of the things I find striking right now is a sort of fashionable op uh, pessimism. So there's pessimism on, on the far right, uh, when you think about something like immigration, for example, right, which basically says, look, these immigrants that are coming in, they're somehow inferior uh, culturally or perhaps even biologically, and that's why they earn a lot less, that's why uh, they're not truly integrating, that's why they're not learning the language, right? You, you know that kind of rhetoric from the far right. Now, I don't think uh, most people here would agree with that. Uh, most people uh, in the mainstream and on the left don't agree with that. But sometimes we, all of us, are guilty of a similar pessimism, which says, no, 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 look, that attribution of blame is completely wrong. But it's true, for example, that immigrants from El Salvador and Mexico and other places today don't have the same opportunities as Irish and Italian immigrants did 100 years ago. Because our society is so racist and so discriminatory that we don't stand a chance, that we can't integrate into the mainstream, that they are doing really terribly, that they are really, really excluded, right? And of course there's real injustice and real discrimination, and we have to be very clear and upfront about that. Before this book, I actually looked at the data. And it turns out that the children or grandchildren of immigrants have a much higher likelihood of uh, making uh, economic progress and educational progress than the children or grandchildren of similarly uh, situated uh, 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 Americans who've been in the country for much longer. Uh, and actually, the best data suggests that the rate at which uh, people from, from Mexico and El Salvador and other countries today rise the economic ranks is relatively slow, but it's about the same speed that Italian and Irish immigrants rose 100 years ago. It's a slow process. It always has been a slow process. Now, that obviously shows that the far right is wrong to say that there's something somehow inferior about these immigrants, that people from El Salvador are less likely or less able to succeed than people from Italy or Ireland were 100 years ago. But it also shows that despite the real discrimination which exists, 
It's just not true that non-white immigrants today can't succeed in the way that white immigrants succeeded 100 years ago. And so I think that, uh, you know, we need to be realistic, but we also need to be realistic optimists. Um, on that realistically optimistic note, um, I, I am happy to take some questions from the audience. Um, I think there's a microphone. There's a microphone there. Take your mask off Thank to you. ask your question. So I'm much older than both of you. Oh, and I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, I remember, I, grew, I was born in the 40s, 1940s. Uh, and I remember when people were optimistic. It, it was right after World War II. Um, people came together, and there was tremendous optimism in the country. And it's hard for me to understand what has changed, except that life is much more uh, uncertain than it was when I was growing up. Um, it, it, when I was growing up, if you had a factory job, union or non-union, you could support, you could buy a home, you could have a wife at home, you only needed one income for the house, the car, uh, an education, uh, a college education, uh, and a pension, and, and health care, and all that. That's no longer true. Um, and I don't understand the vitriol that you talked about, and the fact that there's so much, that people admire Trump so much, and his idea is to destroy the idea of democracy that we grew up with. Uh, my father was in World War II in the Battle of the Bulge. Um, and why 40% of people assume that things are, that the government is wrong and the election was stolen, I don't understand why. We've had waves of immigration, mm -hmm. Irish, Italians, and Jews. And they were never, when they came, everyone hated them. Mm -hmm. And there were, you know, no Irish, no, no dogs, no Irish. Uh, no Irish, no Jews. And it all s worked out. Mm. And I don't understand why the, the descendants of these same people don't understand about their, their own history. Yeah. So I think, look, I, I, I think that's a great question. That's not an easy answer. I, I'm, I'm, I don't think I can give you an answer that's going to be fully satisfactory. But there are a few important differences which are worth talking about, right? Um, uh, you know, I, I, I think sometimes about my, my grandmother, uh, who was born in Lviv, so mm -hmm. or what is today Ukraine, um, uh, survived the war actually in the Soviet Union and Georgia and uh, uh, was a convinced communist, um, uh, lived in Poland in the 50s and 60s, was thrown out of a country by the communist regime in a sort of um, uh, uh, kind of pogrom in, in 68, and then uh, came to Sweden where she lived on a sort of minimal state pension uh, for the rest of her life. So really at the very bottom rung of Swedish society. And uh, I would always go and visit her with my mom in the summers. And every time that I was in uh, Sweden in her apartment, you know, wha every summer, once, once she would look around this apartment and sigh deeply and say, you know, Yasha, never in my life could I have imagined that I would end my life in such luxury. So the difference between what somebody had available to them growing up in, in the 20s in, 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 in Central Europe and what they had in, in these Western societies, uh, you know, by the 90s was just enormous, right? And that did give people a kind of bottom line trust in the political system. Mm -hmm. They never liked DC, you know, they never liked politicians. But they said, hey, you know, something seems to be working. I'm doing better than my parents, where well, my kids are going to be doing better than me. Let's let them do their thing. And today they feel like, hey, I'm not doing better than my parents. My kids are going right. to do worse than me. So, you know, I think there is also one other difference, um, uh, which does make it harder and which relates to the topic of his book which is that after the very restrictive immigration laws of the 1920s, right. there actually wasn't much immigration for many decades. Right. And so uh, that society in the 40s and 50s and 60s was integrating a lot of people who had relatively recent histories of immigration, right. but the number of people born outside the United States was actually much lower than it is now. And we're now close to the highest levels of foreign-born Americans that we've had uh, you know, in centuries. Um, and, and that does make it harder 
um, I in those ways. And, and that in particular drives the kind of demographic panic on the, on the right of a political spectrum. Yeah, I, I, I tend to think that there's a role in which the onslaught of information also plays and yes. the confusion that people feel about reality um, as a result, that that's also a, um, a part of the explanation. Um, another question or another comment? Comments are also okay. Thank you already for this wonderful talk. Uh, I've m relevant to my question is that I'm of Indian origin and I'm a Jain, so I'm a minority religion within this massive religious structure. Um, and so I've always felt that there's, n there's no game I could play where I get to be on top. Mm. Because if, you're <laughs> if your religion is six million people in a country of 1.3 billion, you gotta get along. Um, and, and they did a good job of it, but that brings me to what I heard in your concept of patriotism and having this third way is based on possession. That, and what I mean by possession is that in some way if you, if you have a cultural patrimony that you possess, that somehow you become. Now there's also an interplay of if someone lets you. And I've very much lived that because it drives certain types of groups of people crazy when I possess my Americanness the place in which I'm born, but then I possess a certain kind of Indianness or Jane, and and this sort of why do you possess that? You don't you 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 have to choose, which is the strangest thing for anyone who possesses many cultures, as as you do, as so many people in this place do, which brings me to the phrase "We are making progress," a surprise that breaks my brain when anyone who is not a what I call a fiver, a white Christian male landowning um, heterosexual, <laughs> which is to say, if you're not of those groups, but if a black person says, we have made progress, I'm like, in what way did you need to make progress? You lived. Somebody else had to progress to realize that you also get to possess the story. So that's to all to say, I wonder often that I care about that because I'm never going to be a majority anywhere, so I need this great experiment. It's my only shot, and as a woman, 51% of us, we do not have another shot other than to have an experiment in which everyone gets to be equal in some way. Would I feel that way if <laughs> I were someone else? And I, I say that because how do we convince people who have power in any of these places that you've mentioned to want to share it? It's my ask is clear. Right, right. But so, that's yeah. So, so a couple of things. So the first is just, uh, you know, on on this phrase, uh, progress, right, um, uh, and perhaps on the belonging as well. Just, just two things that do make me optimistic about the current state of the United States. So, uh, one is that I think for most people, they they are influenced by the culture of origin, and they um, uh, want to maintain significant ties to it, whether it's in your case, uh, obviously your, your religious dimension, the Jainness, but also the Indianness. And at the same time, they also uh, feel a part of this country. And um, uh, we obviously have to have a notion of what it means to be American, which allows that, which celebrates that. And there are people who reject it. Um, but I think the majority uh, of a population uh, is on board with that, and the great majority of people who have relatively recent histories of immigration are also on board with that. They feel American, they claim their Americanness, and despite some annoying comments sometimes where are you really from or whatever, I think most of the time the majority of society uh, actually uh, embraces and accepts that as well. Um, on on African Americans, look, the, uh, I talk a lot in the book about uh, you know one of the classic modes of failure of diverse societies is what I call domination, and the, the system of chattel slavery was one of the most extreme forms of domination. And that has very long lasting effects, and it obviously affects the standing of African Americans in our society today. It explains why there con continues to be significant wage and uh, uh, wealth gaps and, 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 and so on and so forth. At the same time, it's also important not to fall into the trap of Donald Trump, who said in 2016, uh, you know, you all don't have a job. I, I, I'm, I, I wish I could remember the exact phrase, but it's basically like, you know, you're all out of a job, you know, your schools are failing, what the hell do you have to lose? And I think people were rightly outraged by that because that is a caricature 
or what, what African American life is like today. So you do have a problem of uh, some people in, in neighborhoods of concentrated disadvantage uh, because of a history of injustice um, uh, being very excluded. But uh, when you look at sort of a median African American, they're middle class. They live in relatively affluent suburbs. They have white collar jobs. If they're below the age of 40, they've gone to college for a number of years. Um, they're more likely to have uh, employer sponsored health care than to have to buy it on the open marketplace or to be uninsured. So the, the completely dystopian picture is wrong. And actually, when you look at uh, measures of optimism, it turns out that African Americans, Latinos as well, are more optimistic about the American dream and more optimistic about the future of America than white Americans are. Um, so that brings us to, 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 to your core question, which is, you know, how do you tell people uh, that they should be on board of a great experiment, right? People who have something to lose, who might say, hey, I have a privilege that I don't want to give up. And I think part of that I is a project of this book, right? So I try to speak to everybody, but, but one of the addressees is that person who's saying, look, I'm not a complete asshole, otherwise we're not going to read the book anyway, you know? Um, but, but I also am worried about some of these changes, and I'm worried about the idea that, uh, you know, supposedly the kind is going to be majority-minority and then everything will change, and, you know, and I'm worried about, uh, you know, perhaps some immigrants not integrating right or whatever. There are just people who are reasonable who feel the pull of some of those concerns, right? I think what we have to be able to offer is a vision of a future of society that most people, not everybody, but most people, whatever group they're a part of, would actually want to live in. And that's where the optimism comes in. Because I think if you tell them, whatever we do, the future is going to be really bleak. And the best we can hope for is that, you know, perhaps uh, uh, the sort of group of people of color is going to win uh, uh, in the way that sort of some democratic strategists think. Um, and then we'll inverse the unfair power relations of the past and just have different kind of power relations. Then people get on board and say, well, hang on a second, that sounds threatening to me. I think if you paint the picture of, of a future in which, uh, uh, for example, our political system is less polarized by race, um, a future in which we're able to live well together, that's likely to give that answer. And part of that is, is the stick on the other end of what it would mean to fail. That's why that history is important. That failure is terrible for everybody. Thank you. One, one more. From, from the lady with excellent literary taste. <laughs> <laughs> um, I turned it into my notebook. Thank you. Um, I'm such a fan of y'all. Thank you so much for being here. Um, my question um, is unfortunately multi-part, and I'll try to distill that to one. And it, it's largely related to, I think, the fragility of the ideal that both the previous questioners have um, of nodded to and that this sounds wonderful and yet and so I guess I would like a little bit more thought from y'all about um, yes while a majority of Americans may feel hopeful you still have the facts on the ground of who is elected and you have things like social media <coughs> misinformation which a lot of people seem not only willing to believe but happy to believe because it supports what they want to experience and feel and so I'm just not sure how the ideal overrides the strength of those other negatives. And in terms of progress, for example, like we're seeing, you know, walking back women's rights, reproductive rights all over the country, walking back trans rights and LGBT. I mean, that's definitely going backwards. And so how do you how do you how do you get enough people to where you can actually change the political reality here? And and so we have enough time to try. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I mean, we, we could sort of debate it point by point. Uh, on some of this, I'm likely to disagree. I think when you look at where we're at on LGBT rights today compared to 30 or 20 or even 10 years ago, we're much further. 10 years ago, we had no same-sex marriage in this country, right? So I think there are always people who want to roll it back, but but to say that on net we've rolled it back, I I think just 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 isn't actually right. Now. Um, uh, how do we make progress despite the very worrying political end? I mean, two things. The first is we have an election coming up in France in a, in a couple of days. And I've been trying to understand why Marine Le Pen is likely to lose, though not certain to lose, um, but, but nearly certainly going to get the highest number of votes for any far-right candidate in the history of the French Fifth Republic. 
And look, you can talk about Macron's failings, and he has some real failings, and you can talk about the fact that Le Pen ran a smart campaign, which by all accounts she did, but that doesn't quite get there. I mean, France is an affluent country with a pretty generous welfare state that's close to full employment. Why are people sort of that despairing? And I do think that this pessimism from all sides of a political spectrum is one of the things that explains that. So if you have a deep pessimism on the right that says, Everything is a complete disaster, and you know the banlieues are a hellhole, and uh, you know this is the last chance to save a French nation, as as one even more far right competitor of Le Pen put it in his best-selling book, uh, of saving nation from sort of suicide. When the other side says, "Well, look, we don't really have a positive vision to offer. We can just tell you how terrible and unfair and unjust everything is," then people say, "All right, well, let's let's go for the pessimism over there that at least blames others rather than ourselves, right?" And so I think we need to have a positive vision to offer in its place. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be enough, right? Like, I'm not, in that sense, I'm sort of, I'm semi-optimistic, but I know that lots of diverse societies in the history of the world have ended up going really terribly wrong. Yeah. And sometimes we've gone terribly wrong after decades or centuries when things seem to be going pretty well. And that's absolutely a possibility for our future. And the political level is one of the things that raises that likelihood. We could get Donald Trump reelected in 2024 or 2028, it's one of his allies perhaps, and that could be an absolute disaster. But what we need in order to stop that from happening is actually pride of, of, of some of the accomplishments that in the breadth of society we're able to sustain at the moment. That is the best defense against that complete failure. So one way that I'm thinking about this is, is quite simple. You know, we have uh, a, a war of the political elites. And I prefer one side to the other, but, but it's, it's a really deep sort of cultural civil war of the elites. But, but a lot of people in society aren't part of that, and they're going about their lives and actually living pretty decently and improving things. And the question is whether that, that war at the top that you see on cable news and in Congress is going to get generalized to all of society, or whether the rest of society can defend itself uh, against the imposition of that war. And that's an open question. But 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 it tells us what we need to do if we want to succeed. Um, I see we're really almost at eight o'clock at the hour. There are two more people I think who want to ask questions. Maybe you could we could hear from both of you, or maybe oh you want you're resigning, I'm right? Just standing. You're just standing there, all right. <laughs> so we'll one more question, and then and then we'll we'll stop. Yeah. So I think I'm the only one. Um, <coughs> I mean, you acknowledge that uh, we all belong to many different groups with with which we identify. And uh, that's why we have to juggle these multiple identities um, and multiple groupishness. Mm. Um, but once in a while, there is one identity that becomes so decisive, so, so dominant that we are ready to kill in the name of it. And it often happens when this identity is threatened by some external threat. Mm. So I think in the history of humanity, we've often built these dominant identities in response to external threats. Now, in this context, I, I really wonder what, what, what you think and whether you, you touch upon in, the, in, your, um, in your book that in the world in which we are living now, we are facing a lot of global threats mm. yeah, as humans. And it's biodiversity, it's climate change, it's ocean acidification, lots of things, yeah, which would require a development of, of another group identity, you know, the, the universal mega identity of us as humans. Earthlings. So, say again? Earthlings. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I wonder, what, what do you think about, uh, about, well, about the ways to develop this identity to, mm, you know, except for drinking ayahuasca and meditating <laughs> or, or, or waiting for the alien invasion, which would be an ideal external threat for us to develop human identity. You're, 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 you're taking away my punchline. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, look, there's, there's one and one only way in which that might work, which is if there's a credible threat of alien invasion tomorrow. <laughs> and, and that might actually uh, unite humanity in, in defense against it. Unfortunately, I don't think that even things like uh, climate change, which is a very serious threat, are going to do that because it's too abstract, right? Like you need uh, for that kind of group formation an outgroup that's actually, uh, I mean, human or perhaps alien, but but you know, a sentient being, right? But like 
climate change is not an enemy that works for the formation of that kind of in-group strongly enough. So um, I, I love the idea of, of, of cosmopolitanism, of saying, you know, why shouldn't we care equally about every person in the world? Why shouldn't we have the same obligations to people who are 10,000 miles away from us than to people who are around the corner? And there's a strong ethical core to that. And some people are capable uh, uh, of genuinely living that, but very, very few people. Right, most people just have a special um, uh, care for what is theirs. You know, when, when I hear about a hor horrible terror attack somewhere far away, it saddens me. But when I hear about a horrible terror attack somewhere that I know, where I can sort of picture the scene, it affects me differently. I, w I wish it wasn't like that, but I think I'm very human in that respect. And so, you know, part of the answer here is to have multiple identities. Right, so I think it's great to have group identities. It's great to say, uh, I'm proud to be uh, a Christian or a Muslim or a Jew. I'm proud to be, you know, have heritage from from El Salvador, or Vietnam, or Ireland. Um, uh, that's wonderful. At the same time, we should also have a national identity, an inclusive national identity that says, Hey, there's also a level which makes me say I might be, you know, a Hispanic uh, uh, Catholic in LA. Um, but I also have special solidarity with, uh, you know, a, a Protestant white guy in Michigan and, uh, you know, an African-American Baptist in Boston or whatever it may be, right? So I think that's really helpful because it helps us manage that groupishness within the national level. But then we should obviously also have an element that goes beyond that, an element of saying I also care about the planet. I also care about people who are far away from me and, and for them to live decently. And so I think the way to manage our groupishness is not to play those identities against each other, but to find the kinds of institutions which allow us to feel like we can be true to those different identities at the same time, and which make sure that conflict is managed, that I'm not scared about the other group, uh, but I have a vision of what it would look like for us to live together in peace and prosperity. On that excellent note, I think we'll stop. Is there now book signing? Yes, How does that work? There, 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 there <laughs> will be a book signing. Uh, thank you both, for, first of all, Yasha and Anne. You know, as, as, as Anne as Ann said at the outset, these two teach a class together, and listening to them this evening, I'm very jealous of their students. <laughs> Copies of Yasha's book are available at the checkout desk. He'll be up here signing. Please fold up your chairs, and thank you again for coming. And buy Anne's books, too. <laughs> <laughs>